time for the Cubs Weekly Podcast. It's presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs Checking. Open online today at wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. Elise Menneker, your host today, alongside Cubs reporters Tony Andraki and Andy Martinez. Guys, we're fresh off uh, Arizona. We're back here in cloudy, cold Chicago, ready to talk <laughs> some preseason predictions. Um, so honestly, I think we'll just get right into it. Uh, Favorite, let's go back though to the warm rather the sunshine, the spring. Uh, let's start with Andy, our favorite spring moment. What do you got? Um, so I'm going to go with the day that baseball returned, that the lockout was lifted. Um, I remember uh, I got to Arizona to do some prospect stuff with some of the, you know, some of the Spanish speaking prospects. And um, it was the day that, uh, you know, they pushed back spring training or the start of the season another week. And it looked like, you know, things were all gloomy. Um, and I remember hanging out with, uh, Scott, uh, Shagnon, our, our, uh, our awesome video man, do it all. I don't want to, you know, silo him <laughs> as one thing. Um, but he, you know, we're sitting there, we're like, oh man, like, I guess we're going home. And then the next day baseball's back and it's like, oh my gosh. And it was just like, it, it went from zero to 60 faster than any car in the world. And, uh, it was, it was, it was a ton of fun. And then I'm going to go with a one B of say a Suzuki signing, you know, I think the the buzz and excitement when uh, he when he first got to camp and, you know, all the guys coming up to him and all the media and all the presence, that was that was a lot of fun. That was my favorite two favorite things from uh, from spring for sure. Tony, what do you got? Yeah, I think it has to be really the kind of the last moment or one of them that we've seen is just Ethan Roberts. I thought that was so incredible. It was this awesome, wholesome moment. You know, it's like hey, these are real people, not just athletes. And it's like, you know, he talked about how much it meant to him, how much it meant to his hometown, you know, calling his wife while while um, his wife was at the doctor with their kid and, you know, just going through all this stuff. And just that moment, I think the way David Ross presented that in the dugout, like, how's your hand? Can you still shake my hand? And, you know, after getting hit by the comebacker and he's like, good. He's like, well, good, because you made the team. Like, I just thought it was so great all around. It must have been amazing to be, either side of that to be Ross to tell a player that to be Roberts to to get that news and to make your first big league roster ever on opening day it was just so cool it, it reminded me a lot I think of you know just like why we do this even from a media perspective it was just awesome to see that to see a guy be so genuine and wholesome um and so yeah it, it that pumped me up. It gave me a lot of energy. It, you know, I'm like a huge Ethan Roberts fan now to see, you know, and at least you and I talked to him in spring, just like four or five days before this announcement. And I came away from that feeling like, you know, Hey, this guy's going to be somebody to watch now, even more so like I, you know, I feel like I'm a big Roberts fan in his storyline. Yeah, for sure. I think we both walked away from our conversation with him feeling the same way. Like we are excited to see him pitch, not just for the player that he is, but also for his personality. And I, I'm pretty much on board with both of you because first I would say the Ethan Roberts moment, just like you said, the human aspect to it. And then Andy, like I'm in the same boat because I also felt like even just getting to know say a Suzuki was a highlight because his personality is just so wonderful. And then to see him starting to produce on the field as well um, was a lot of fun and he'll continue I think to be a, a lot of fun to watch uh, and keep an eye out on. So I, I feel like for sure it was nice to wrap up with uh, a fun story and kind of begin with one too. So for sometimes uh, I know spring can, can feel like it's just spring. These games don't count, but I feel like for the Cubs, there actually was a lot that we had going on and, and a lot that we can continue to look forward to. Um, so with that said, leading into our next question, what would be the storyline, Tony, that you're most looking forward to following this Cubs season? You know, I, I think it's just who emerges as, as a long-term piece. We've heard Jed Hoyer talk so much about building that next great Cubs team. And, and I think it's, it's trying to identify these pieces that are going to be a part of that next great Cubs team, whenever that is. And that's so hard to, to project, to prognosticate when that might take place. So, you know, I, who knows if it's, you know, a particularly young guy or if it's, it's, um, you know, some of these like by low type guys with like a change of scenery, like Clint Frazier, um, obviously, Seiya Suzuki, I think, is going to be a big part of it. He's here for the next five years. He's only 27. He's just kind of, you know, in the midst of his prime. 
Um, and then, you know, Justin Steele, is he, is he a long-term rotation piece? Ethan Roberts, is he a closer of the future, a high leverage reliever of the future? You know, Scott F. Ross is somebody who I think really impressed me towards the end of last year. And then talking with him and learning his story this spring even more, you know, he could be a bullpen piece. Uh, same with Keegan Thompson. I think there's a lot of younger pieces, Nico Horner and Madrigal, of course, in the middle. Um, and then, you know, some guy named Brennan Davis is potentially going to get the call up <laughs> this year. And, you know, we'll see how he performs. So to me, that's what I'm watching is, you know, what this means big picture, you know, in 2022, but also just like who's going to be here in 23 and 24 in 26 or 27 and, and be a part of that, that core. Yeah. And I'm right there with you, Tony, that that's kind of where I was leaning towards is just what, what do these, some of these guys in town and, and to piggyback off that, you know, just the development that the Cubs are going to have with all these players, right. You know, you mentioned Brandon Davis and you mentioned, you know, Keegan Thompson and Justin Steele, guys like that. But then, you know, there's another wave right behind them where, where you look at Caleb Killian, and DJ hers and seeing those guys take the next step. Will we see them in 2022? Maybe, maybe not, but there's still a lot of things to keep an eye on um, whether it's in, in Tennessee or, or, or in Iowa, seeing their development and seeing how they how they do uh, and improve is, is going to be just as crucial as some of those guys that you mentioned, because, you know, at the end of the day, yes, if, if those reclamation projects or, or whatever you want to call guys like Clint Frazier, if those pan out, that's great. But you still need those guys to come up like Caleb Killian, like DJ Hers, um, you know, like Kevin Alcantara, guys like that to come up and, and be a part of the core and, and be a part of a, a winning team. Yeah, it's funny because the first thing that I wrote down was prospects for this yeah. one. And uh, and then I crossed it out because I was like, I was overthinking because I feel like as we go through more, <laughs> I'm like, am I just mentioning prospects throughout? So in addition, because obviously I agree with you guys um, in terms of how I had written this. And then I think kind of too going off of your point, Tony. I wrote down the outfield situation. I'm kind of intrigued by that and how that will take shape, knowing that the one of the long-term pieces is, say, a Suzuki, and then how everything else will kind of sort itself out. And then I just kind of threw in there, I don't know if this counts, but I literally just wrote Marcus Stroman, because I think he's just so fun to watch his personality. I'm excited to see him pitch. So just him as a player and personality, I'm kind of just excited to see uh, how he fits in with the team. And he already, you can tell, fits in very well, but just how it kind of evolves over the course of this season. So I think we're all kind of on the same page in terms of where we see um, the team heading and what we have to look forward to. And I think spring training actually gave us a good idea of that too because it was really one of the first times we got a glimpse of all of these guys that we're talking about and i thought it was uh really really positive from a lot of the younger players so when we look at a breakout player andy for this season who comes to mind for you uh, i'm i'm going kind of where tony mentioned justin Steele. you know i was really impressed in a lot of outings he had last year i think of the one i believe it was in pittsburgh uh, we went like five five innings or so and, and pitched great great uh i think that's when you kind of saw all right this is what he can be and i think we've seen him where you know, he can he can pitch to a strikeout or, you know, if he has a runner on base and he's got to, you know, attack a hitter, he can do that. And, uh, you know, I think this is going to be a big year for him. Um, you know, the last I mean, think about the last two years, you know, 2020, where, you know, he's at an alternate site, you know, and then he gets called up for a day, doesn't pitch or anything, then, you know, gets sent back. Then 2021, he's a crucial part of, you know, the beginning of the year where, you know, the team is having success and he's he's that bridge guy. I think David Ross kept always mentioning the bridge guy, him and Keegan Thompson, you know, from the fourth or fifth inning to, to getting to, to Parachafe and, and, and Kimbrell. Um, and then to go back down to Iowa, get stretched out. And he went through the ups and downs of, of being a major league starter, right? You know, he had some outings where you were like, you can see why this was a, a high prospect, a high level prospect. And then you saw where it's like, okay, he's still young. Like he's still figuring it out. Uh, and, and I think this is going to be a big year. And I think, I really believe that he could be, you know, a, a good rotation arm for the Cubs. And I think this is the year to prove it. You know, he'll be, he'll be the game two starter uh, in the 2022 season. And I think that's, that's uh, going to be the, the start of something big for, for Justin Steele and for the Chicago Cubs. Yeah, for me, um, you know, it, it goes back to another player I mentioned in that Clint Frazier. I think he, he, you know, talk about to piggyback off Andy's point, like this is a former top prospect, this elite level talent. Uh, he was somebody that David Ross said, even in Boston, he, the first opportunity he got to be in a draft room, he was hearing about Frazier. I think that was 2013. Um, and when Ross was obviously still a player, but I, I, it was also funny, like Sunday night, Frazier stole a base uh, in Goodyear and then Monday morning we're in the clubhouse and Matt Spiegel from 670 asked Frazier like you know hey your speed looks pretty good 
Frazier jokes, yeah, you know, I told Napoli that I want to steal 30 bases this year. And so he was having fun just joking about that. But I mean, he has the speed. He has the talent to do that. And we've already seen the power, this bat speed that Brian Cashman called legendary when they acquired him in the Andrew Miller trade. And just in general, like this guy is a, is a fun guy to talk to, an interesting personality. And there's something real and powerful about a change of scenery. And for him to come over here to potentially carve out a role for himself at DH and outfield and in a future mix, because he's under team control for three years, including this year, he's only 27. He has all the tools that you could see him being becoming a big part of this team if everything breaks right. So my pick is Clint Frazier. I think that breakout that everybody's long been anticipating happens and all this stuff with concussions and vision issues. He said he feels great right now. He even lost some weight in the off season as he kind of honed in on what he wanted to do to train. So I, I think he puts it all together and this is the Clint Frazier. Everybody always thought they would see. Yeah. Tony, we've been spending too much time together. Cause that's my <laughs> together in Arizona. And yet it's the same about you. I'm sure we will throughout this season, yeah. but yeah. Uh, Clint Frazier is my pick for a lot. I mean, basically everything you described and then just in my own words, I think he's really athletic. Um, and I think he's someone who just needs consistent playing time in the past. He hasn't gotten that in part because of his injuries. It's been difficult. He's described just how difficult last season was for him dealing with the concussion, but I think he hasn't been able to completely show off his potential and all the tools that he has. Uh, because like you said, I think as a prospect, he was seen as a very athletic guy. And I think now we're getting an idea of everything that he can bring. And it, it feels like from him that he's happy, he's in a good place and that that's going to help him as well. Cause I think sometimes too, I look at the intangibles and I think in part that's because he's kind of has the concussion behind him. Sounds like that was really difficult dealing with that last year. So um, yeah, I'm with you. I'm going with Frazier. Um, but Andy, I thought you had a really good point too, because I think in general, the pitching staff, um, it'll be fun to keep an eye on. And I think steel and, and, and to your point with the piggyback stuff uh, in, with Thompson too, with all the weight he lost, even that alone kind of just shows you where these guys are at and how they're coming in to this season. So now just a player to watch Tony in 2022. So not a breakout player, but just who do you want to watch in 2022? It's got to be Seiya Suzuki. I mean, you guys have both touched on it already. The personality he's shown, um, you know, just the, the bad speed. But I think I'm most excited about seeing the adjustments and the plate discipline because this guy makes a lot of contact. We've already seen just the progression in, you know, a half dozen games so far in spring training where he has been able to lay off pitches and now his timing is there and he's going right up the middle. And unfortunately for Cubs pitchers, he's going right up the middle and hitting them a lot in, in yeah. live BP or simulated games. But, you know, he did that all as well in the final game at Sloan park on Monday. And, um, but I mean, working back from down Oh, two and counts to, you know, drawing walks and getting on base, I, I think, and his defense, I think his defense has really impressed me with the high Arizona sun, he has looked, you know, so nonchalant in a good way out there. Like he's very polished and, and confident. And so I think just, you know, in general, like it's gotta be say for me, I'm, I'm going to be so focused on how we adjust, how he handles, you know, he talked about handling the cold and getting used to that. Um, he still joked, you know, even when we talked to him on Monday, he still joked that he's a little worried about getting beer poured on him at Wrigley field by fans. <laughs> But I don't uh, think that is going to happen. I, to him. I cannot imagine that. <laughs> He's I, I really, smooth out there. I think fans will enjoy it. Yes, exactly. So I, and that's it. And that was the last point is just that fans, I think fans yeah. are going to really be drawn to this guy. And I'm really excited to see the reception he gets in this opening weekend at Wrigley. Yeah. And, and you know, I think that was the easy answer. And so, so that's why I kind of try to stay away from say Suzuki. <laughs> You know, but I will say really quickly on that point. Nice try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I will say to that point, you know, uh, Kyle Milinovich, our great social media coordinator, mentioned to me, he's like, he, he's going to struggle a little bit, you know, adjusting to American pitching. But like around May 7th, something's just going to click and he's going to go off. So, or you know, keep, remember a, keep, that, a day, keep a day yeah. uh, on May 7th. Uh, and it, remember, it was Kyle. It wasn't me. I was, <laughs> was going to say, no, Andy, I'm crediting you. you. Okay, yeah. all right. Then, then put it on me. Uh, but the guy I was going to mention was Ian Happ. I think this is going to be, you know, I think this it could be the year that he finally puts it all together. We've seen, I mean, last year, that the, the last two months of the season, he was one of literally one of the best players uh, in baseball. Uh, you look at his OPS was right up there with some of the best players in baseball. Uh, he was, he was on fire. And I think this, you know, I think this is the year, you know, he's, he's kind of that de facto leader in the clubhouse now, you know, with all, with, with guys like Rizzo and, and Brian and Baez gone, like he, him, Jason Hayward, Wilson Contreras, guys like that are now the leaders. And he is 
proving that, you know, hey, like, you, you know, he's taking on that the mantle of the leadership. You saw it as the team rep. And now I think this year we're finally going to see him, you know, be able to put, put it together for a full, for a full season. And I think he's going to be a crucial part. And Rick Sutcliffe mentioned it a couple of times on the broadcast this week. You know, he could be an all-star this season. And, you know, if he puts together the, the performance like he did at the back half of 2021, there's no reason why he wouldn't be a, a, an all-star uh, this season for sure. Yeah, and, and I think uh, both good answers. I feel like at some point we've got to mention Seiya as like someone to watch or something about him. So I know maybe an easy answer, but you got to have it in there. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm going with Brennan Davis. I mean, I know he's not, uh, you know, he's Iowa Cubs right now, but um, I think soon at some point this year, he'll be up with the Cubs. And I think he's a very, very exciting player to watch. I think we got glimpses of it at spring training. I think the hype around him uh, is real and warranted because I think he will live up to that. Uh, another athletic guy in seeing him in person for the first time, I was also very surprised just at his build, very well built, uh, strong, taller guy. And it shows at the plate, high baseball IQ, someone who's ready. And you could just see his focus in spring training and kind of telling you where his mind is at and what his goals are. And I haven't even had a chance to talk to him yet, but I think just from watching him and seeing him with the other players, you're getting a good sense of just how he's carrying himself, um, someone he can be and become with the Cubs. So he's the guy that, especially as we watch some Iowa Cubs games and, um, you know, I think eventually with the Cubs that that will be a fun player to watch. So then kind of on the other end of the spectrum, Andy, under the radar player to keep an eye on. So I originally had Clint Frazier on this list and, okay. you know, hearing you guys talk about Clint Frazier, I'm like, all right, maybe he's clearly not under the radar. <laughs> on the radar. Uh, <laughs> and he is on the radar. I, you know, and I, the reason, the reasoning for under the radar was, you know, you think about the signings that they made, he, he might've been, you know, third, fourth biggest uh, signing uh, of the off season. And so that's why I kind of labeled him under the radar, but some of the he other guys that I had on that field, list, right? Yeah, yeah, You're yeah, probably yeah. thinking about other names ahead of him. Exactly. So, so some of the other names I was looking at was Alfonso Rivas and Michael Hermosillo. Sure. Um, yeah. I, Alfonso Rivas in spring training just really impressed me in the fact that he never took uh, an at-bat off. Um, and that's yeah. so cliche. Cause like, you know, who's going to take an at-bat off, but you know, you know, he was going deep into counts. He was following off pitches and then he would, you know, hit it the other way for a single. And it's just a frustrating at bat. And I think that's something that the Cubs are going to really appreciate, especially from the left, left-handed side. You know, there's one thing uh, about the Cubs is, you know, it leans a little more right-handed, but Alfonso Rivas provides that balance. And, you know, I just think of it like a sixth inning of a close game and it's like, all right, Alfonso, like you, you come up and pinch hit and, and he'll work an at bat and work a single the other way and, and can spark a rally. That's just the kind of bat I think he provides in the lineup. And he can do that from the start, honestly. So, you know, I, someone like that is really important. I think Mark, Michael Hermosillo, one of the best catches I've seen live was that catch he made uh, against the White Sox at, at guarantee rate field um, last yeah. season. You know, I think he's, his defense is fantastic. And I think, you know, we saw glimpses of it before he got hurt. I think he can be a really good, you know, platoon option in center field or across the outfield for that matter. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, having the, the chance and, and Tony, you wrote a great story about it. You know, he finally feels like, you know, this is where he belongs. This is where he's meant to be. And, and there's a reason, you know, the, the Cubs signed him in the offseason and, and brought him back. Uh, and I think we're, we can see that from both from guys like Hermosillo and, and from Rivas. Yeah, I actually wrote down Rivas as well. I just like his good, calm approach. I think he's, a, you know, he's definitely going to make an impact this year. Um, some of the other guys, just two on the pitching side, I think Mark Leiter and Kane Ecker, you know, are just guys that we're going to see at Wrigley this year that are going to impact the pitching staff. Eckert's, you know, a little bit younger. He's only 24, 25, um, has really just topped out at double A so far, but he had some very real stuff and impressed the coaching staff and David Ross in camp this spring, you know, another hard thrower along the, up there with uh, Ethan Roberts, Ben Lieber, and some of these other young relievers coming up. And then Mark Leiter, you know, he's a 31 year old talk about change of scenery. You know, he had Tommy John surgery in 2019, didn't pitch basically for 19 and 20 at all. And then last year had some really eye popping stuff in, in triple a um, with, I think it was the Tigers organization, but really, you know, str like strikeouts, he, he had up over 11 per nine innings and had a lot of swing and miss stuff. And so a guy that can, can impact the rotation can be some rotation depth down in triple a neither guys on the 40 man roster right now. So I definitely consider that like that under the radar section, but I could see both at Wrigley this season. 
So I love Alfonso Rivas and probably because I've been watching him since AAA, I guess he's more on my radar, maybe more so than everyone <laughs> else's, but I love his plate approach. Uh, you guys have said it, just what he brings at the plate, uh, even in the field defensively. At first base, he may not be the biggest guy. I think, you, you know, we'll say he's at six feet, um, but his glove really good. And I know that's something he takes pride and he wants to be, he may not physically be the big target, but I think he believes his athleticism and his skills can provide that. Um, so yeah, Rivas, I think is definitely someone just to continue to watch because he's very, very consistent in a game where it's so hard to do that. I think he uh, makes it look easy actually at times, like not taking it at bat off and, and working the counts like he does is very impressive against the variety of pitchers, especially that you see in spring training. And I'm with you, Kane Eckert. He impressed me like one of the most to impress me in spring training. I think just a really good arm. And then as I got to know him and looked up what he did last year, and I forgot to check this before uh, we came on, but like, maybe like a one nine something ERA two in double a. So just really impressive. He's, um, you know, worked really hard to this point. And I think it's starting to show <clears throat> had a nice conversation with him in the clubhouse, just a guy. Uh, I think if I remember it, trying to limit the walks, just attack the strike zone. So I love to hear about the goals of these guys as they move forward, what they're looking at. So, yeah, I really liked Eckert and, and looking forward to see like kind of how he progresses and where we see him next. Uh, so then we kind of just talked about pitching some hitting, but we just got to talk bomb skis, some home runs. Uh, <laughs> who is going to lead the team in home runs? Tony, we got. I think Frank's going to hit a lot of tanks this year. I okay. think Schwindel will lead the team in homers. Um, I'll have a little bit more on Schwindel later, so I'll just kind of leave it as real soon. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. Andy? Um, first of all, I want to know how long you were practicing or preparing to say Frank that Frank is going to hit a lot of tanks, Tony. Because I know that's probably you probably had that bolded up. Really, the whole time that Elise was talking about Rivas, I was thinking in my head like, what's the best way that I can listening. say that? You don't and even know what like, you said about Alfonso Rivas. Yeah, I'm not no, even she, offended. She said he was on her radar. I was listening, but I was also in my head like, what's the most clever way to say this? And I was like. Frank is going to hit a lot of tanks. That was the best I came up with. That's that. all you're saying. Got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have a good rhyme for mine, but uh, I think Ian Happ's going to uh, Ian Happ's going to lead the team in home runs. A uh, career high 25 last year, and, and I, you know, I piggybacking off why you know he's my player to watch. You know, you know, I think if if my prediction's right about him having a uh, putting it all together this year, you know, I think that's going to lead to a lot more home runs, maybe 30 or more. Uh, and I think that'll 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 leave the Cubs. But I think there's going to be a little bit more balance in terms of who's hitting who's hitting the home runs or the, or the bomb skis this year. <laughs> I'm just going Patrick Winston. I mean, That's I a safe bet. Yeah. yeah. Here he had, uh, because he definitely shows that he has the potential, can do it, uh, especially given at bats from the start of the season up in the big leagues throughout. I think he will be an exciting player to watch. I know we've always with him talked about just cutting down on the strikeouts, but the home run ball is there for him. So no question about that. Uh, so let's go back to the pitching side and this is, I think a tougher one, but let me know what you guys think who will lead the team in saves. Um, so I think the number is going to be low in terms of how many saves it's led with, but I'm going to go with Agreed. Michael Givens. Yeah. And I think the reason it's going to be low is because I think we might see situations where, you know, I, uh, you know, there's a, there's a patch of righties coming up in the totally. lineup in the seventh inning and it's a two run game. All right. Givens is going to come up here. Uh, and, and so then maybe, you know, that day, uh, you, you know, someone else might get the save, whether it's a Rowan Wick or, or whoever might pick up that save that day. Um, but I, you know, I think Michael Givens will, will get the, the, the most of the opportunities, but I think this is something where David Ross is, is, is going to be using, you know, the best arm or the best option in that situation, whether that's the sixth inning, whether that's the ninth inning, whatever. I, so I, I wouldn't be looking too much, too closely at, um, you know, if someone has, has only, if the leader only has like 22 saves, I wouldn't consider that, you know, necessarily something to, to, to panic about. Yeah, I'm going to go with Givens, too. Um, I'll admit I only heard part of Andy's answer because, um, you know, my dog Clarence was again, you're just not listening to us and thinking about it. Yeah, that. just no. again, selective <laughs> listening. Um, dog doesn't like my answer, so Clarence is unhappy that another dog walked by his uh, his front yard. But I'm going to go with Givens because he's closed before, has some of the best swing and miss stuff in the bullpen. And really, I think just my concern is how built up he'll be at the start of the season. We've only seen him in one Cactus League game. Um, but, you know, once he gets into a groove, I think Givens is the guy that Ross will go to most in the ninth inning. Yeah, I think um, I had Givens written down, too. Just I thought he looked really strong in his outing, a good arm. 
And I think to your point, Andy, especially early on, I think it's just going to kind of be by committee, see how things go. I know that Ross has talked about, of course, when you have that set closer, you can kind of work backwards uh, and then, you know, kind of work your innings in between. But um, I just think for now, the situation will be more so still getting a feel, especially, I mean, you don't, you don't know, everyone's in such a different spot. You don't know where guys are at and how they're going to move forward. So I think that'll depend a lot too on just um, how things progress and guys may look different now than they do in a few weeks weeks and, and just kind of how things pan out. So yeah, I think we're all kind of on the same page there in terms of what we've seen early. So then this one will be fun because looking ahead at the schedule, Tony, what's the series that you're like, this is what I'm looking forward to. Cubs in Yankee stadium, June 10th through 12th. Uh, anytime the Cubs get to play the Yankees or Red Sox, wherever they get to go is amazing. But, you know, Yankee stadium is only obviously a place they've been to just a couple of times in the last you know, a few decades. So I, I think, I think that's just really cool. In the middle of summer, it'll be like great weather you anticipate, um, you know, just to see how the Cubs match up against a, a Yankees team as well, you know, in that lineup with Stanton and judge and, and, you know, Rizzo obviously is there too. So I think there's a lot of really cool watchable aspects of that, like mid June weekend series. For me, it's, I'm staying with that division. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the Toronto blue Jays uh, on August 29th through the 31st. Um, I think Toronto is going to be a really fun team to watch. And if you haven't been up to Toronto, Toronto is one of my favorite cities in the world to visit. I hear that. I've never been. I, Everyone I think it's a, there seems yeah, I think it's a marquee road trip. You know, I think <laughs> if the right people are listening, it's a marquee road trip. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's and it's a fantastic – the Rogers Center is awesome. It's it's a fantastic place to, ca- to catch a game, especially, you know, if they open the roof up. Uh, and there's there's going to be a lot of fun players to watch with with Toronto, whether it's Vladimir Guerrero Jr. or or Kevin Biggio, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know that's one. And then I got a yeah, I, I had a one B in this situation too. Uh, the Field of Dreams game. It's not really a series, but it's a game on yeah, on, on the 11th, course. right before that yeah. Toronto series. That's going to be that's going to be super super fun and super special for sure. Yeah, Field of Dreams game uh, didn't come to mind, but I'm glad you mentioned it because that for sure will be awesome. And so Tony, I actually have the series. I don't know. Look at what yours was. I have June 2nd through 5th. So a few days in between yours um, against the Cardinals. I think actually Cubs fans will hate me for this <laughs> one. Um, but it's because obviously you have this is at home. That one's at Wrigley. And uh, the first time they're playing them also in uh, the season, just the return of Pujols. I think that's just always a really fun um, matchup. His final hurrah. Uh, just kind of seeing him one last time in the rivalry. So that for me, I think will be uh, a great weekend. And I I hope by then it's feeling like baseball season, right? We're like in the summer weather. So you just get the whole, the whole effect there. Uh, Going back kind of then to prospect talk, which Cubs prospect do you think will make the biggest leap in 2022, Andy? So I'm going with, I, this is kind of a, a layup answer, but I'm going with DJ Hers. I think, you know, he was the pitcher of the year last year, but I think, you know, everyone's been raving about him. And I think he really could be, you know, that that guy that pops up. I like Cole Franklin a lot too. I think those are two guys that are, are going to keep an eye out. And, and one one who, after speaking with him, I think is, is, is someone I'm going to be keeping an eye on closely too, is Kevin Made, a you know, shortstop. He was playing shortstop in Myrtle Beach last season. Ed Howard was at second base. Uh, he is he is uh, a very very good glove. The, the Cubs signed him out of the Dominican for a million dollars. Uh, so that's you know that that's you know how highly they think of it. There's not a lot of guys that get signed for for that much. Uh, and he he is uh, a very aggressive hitter. And when he makes contact, uh, he he makes contact. So th- those are some some guys that I think are going to make some big jumps this year and and might be if they weren't already well known, they they will be very well known among uh, Cubs prospects for sure. Yeah, I'm going to go with James Triantos, um, second round pick last summer, uh, you know, out of high school. So really young kid, just turned 19 in January. And he, in his first three big league at bats this spring, you know, base hit, base hit, base hit. Third one was off of Madison Bumgarner too. So like, you know, there's just something about this kid, like obviously so young, he has great bat to ball skills, not quite sure what position he'll play yet. If it, you know, if he'll stick at second, play some third, but like that bat is real. And, and he hasn't got as much, you know, he hasn't received as much like top 100 prospect love as I thought he might, but I think that'll change this year. I think by, by midsummer and definitely by the end of the season, he's going to be firmly entrenched on top 100 
prospects around the game. I think, you know, he'll be possibly even top three by that point if Brennan Davis graduates in the Cubs system. So James Triantos looks legit. Everything I've seen from him, everything I've heard from him, everything people were talking about and buzzing about with him at Cubs camp. Uh, he's the guy for me that, that I can see just jumping up those rankings. Both names that you hear a lot when you talk about the Cubs prospects and this one, I'm sure now people are very familiar with Pete Crow Armstrong. I, I feel like he's already um, made jumps. We've seen him in action in spring training. He's a phenomenal ball player, outfielder, great glove, good speed, uh, quick bat. And I just feel like, especially after watching him in spring, I was trying to decide because I thought we really got a good look, even at Howard, some great plays in the infield, a uh, good contact bat from him. And he's young. So I think he naturally actually could make a big leap as he puts on like uh, builds uh, his strength and just continues to work at the game because someone drafted out of high school. I think it's only natural to make big leaps. So I think he could also be on the list, but I was trying to think about just guys where I think we're going to start hearing almost more and more about, because I feel like now we're starting to get familiar with some of these up and comers. And um, I think it's just a matter of time until we start to see them more consistently. So then uh, when we're talking about a surprise of the season, who or what, Tony, do you think will be the biggest surprise of the Cubs season? I think this lineup is going to surprise people, uh, especially around the game, because there's a lot of names and pieces and nobody's quite sure how it's going to fit. But the last two months of last year, I think, taught us quite a bit that this lineup, I mean, they were they were good. They were very good and they were able to, you know, they batted around, they had diversity and, and all this stuff that Jed Hoyer and before him, Theo Epstein, were talking about, you know, having not quite all or nothing hitters, but just a diverse group and skill set. And they have that. They have contact bats and Nico Horner and Madrigal. They have good plate discipline in, in guys like Seiya Suzuki. Uh, they have Power and Schwindel, who also has contact and good plate discipline, but just the way they can match up. And we saw it a little bit in that Monday night or Monday afternoon game um, at Sloan Park against the White Sox, where they can just get in a rhythm and they can get keep the ball moving, keep the line moving, and you know play matchups with lefties and righties. And I think Ross has a lot of options, so I think the offense definitely will be um, you know surprise to some people just in terms of how it meshes and how they're able to perform. And and a lot of those names, obviously, that Cubs fans are so accustomed to are gone, and, and the Bryant's and Rizzo's and Javi's and all that. And I think the way they mesh together will be a very pleasant surprise for this team in just the sense that like, this is, you know, it's the Dodgers lineup looks amazing. I'm not saying the Cubs are necessarily going to outrank them in any category, but I think they'll be a, you know, a lot better than maybe what a lot of people outside of Chicago think. For me, it's, uh, you know, I think the bullpen is going to be a really, really solid bullpen. Uh, I think this has a potential to be, you know, top 15, top 10 uh, bullpen for sure in baseball, at least. And, you know, you look at some of the guys, Jesse Chavez has looked great. Uh, yeah. Chris Martin, you know, he won a World Series like Jesse Chavez did too. You know, they were part of a World Series winning, you know, bullpen. Uh, Michael Givens, you know, was was a was a good piece that the, the 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 Reds flipped. There's a lot of these guys, and then you mentioned some of the homegrown guys like Ethan Roberts, but Ben Leaper's a guy I think we might see in 2022. Mm -hmm. Manny Rodriguez, he's got that that 100 mile an hour. If he can come up and you know have a little bit of better control, you know, these th this is a bullpen that has a lot of you know a lot of funk too. When you mentioned Scott Efros, um, you know, a lot of different arm angles, a lot of different deliveries, a lot of different you know styles. The, the bullpen uh, is something that I think could be really, 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 really good for the for the Cubs. And I think it's going to be something that's going to be really important, especially early on in the season. Uh, I think the bullpen is going to surprise a lot of people for sure. Yeah, I basically was just kind of on the same page. I was thinking pitching overall, but I think you're on with the bullpen because I don't think the rotation is necessarily going to surprise people because I think we see a lot of positives there, especially with the addition of Stroman and if Miley then or when he gets healthy, um, that'll be great. And I think there's a lot still uh, that Steele and Thompson are out to prove. And I think often we forget about Mills, how he can be in there. This was Army Knife bullpen <laughs> or rotation. Um, did your dog like or not like my answer there? Yeah, maybe don't mention Alec Mills. Yes, he did. I don't know. Okay, okay. Yeah. Awful, awful answer but i was also going to say maybe he'll like this i i'm actually with you tony i think that this batting order is i think it'd be pretty solid and you have the addition of someone like madrigal uh obviously high contact good uh just a good hitter i think if you get even someone like a rivas in there from time to time uh or hermosillo what he can bring i think a lot of these guys that we're talking about too they want to prove something so when you have that chip on your shoulder there can be a lot of production that comes along with that as long as there's not the pressure 
that you put on yourself too. So uh, I I'm, I'm with you. I kind of ride the end of last season. And I think I, I had a lot of fun watching the offense. And um, I think that you take that into this season and, and guys are even looking to perform better than they did last year or, or kind of build off of maybe what they were able to do, say like a half and towards the end and want to do that more consistently from the beginning. So yeah, I think it'll be fun. Uh, this is a fun one, actually, um, kind of in times hit on this a little bit, but bigger picture teams to beat like the team that you're watching or teams plural, um, in each league. So Tony, who would you say? I hey, know. Uh, it's gotta be the Dodgers and the NL just mm -hmm. what they've done. You know, they lose Seager, but they gained Freddie Freeman. They still have Trey Turner. Um, you know, they lose Max Scherzer, but then. They signed Andrew Heaney. They just traded for Craig Kimbrell. They signed Daniel Hudson. They have a great bullpen, awesome lineup. Like, they're just incredible. And then in the AL, I know Andy touched on it before, but the Blue Jays, I, I just love what they've done this offseason. I think they're just this, this fun team to watch. Um, you know, they traded for Matt Chapman, uh, signed Kevin Gossman and, and Kikuchi for the lineup or for the rotation. And then that Jose Barrios trade from last year, I think, was just really cool as well. So, um, you know, I, and it, it's just the like the Blue Jays are a lot of fun, you know, like they have a lot of power. They have speed. They have these young guys They have Vlad Jr. Like uh, so I think the Blue Jays are the team to beat. I think they uh, they take the AL East this year. Yeah, so you, you stole my two teams, Tony. Uh, but oh, sorry. You know, I stole uh, my so, two teams. Well, yeah, no. okay, so then we're too predictable, I guess, like you mentioned, Elise. <laughs> um, but so I'll, I'll, I'll choose another option for the NL. I want to see what the Giants do. Um, you know, they they were they won the West last year. You know, everyone talks about the Dodgers, but the Giants won the West last year, and they reloaded pretty well. They added Carlos Rodon. Uh, they, they've done a pretty good job of finding those, you know, those those forgotten guys. Like you think about like your Stremski, guys like that, that – you know, that, that they've turned around and made them, you know, serviceable players that, that have fit their, their mold, Lamont way, guys like that. I'm curious to see, cause you know, it, I'm not saying they're going to win 106 games or whatever it was last year, but they, they definitely, you know, are, are a team to, to, to keep an eye out. And then, yeah, like you mentioned that, you know, top to bottom, Toronto is so, so stacked. Uh, Gossman, Barrios, Rio, Kikichu, uh, Nate Pearson's a young up and coming arm. And then you look at the infield, Guerrero, Bichette, uh, Biggio. And let's keep in mind, this is 2022. This is all their, their sons. It's not the, it's not the guys that we grew up watching. <laughs> um, but then Tiasco Hernandez, uh, George Springer. And then it, it's just like such a stacked team. I could keep going on and on about the Toronto Blue Jays, but the thing about them is that they play in such a tough division. Like the Yankees are no slouch. The Red Sox, Alex core always has them playing well. And then, you can't ever forget about the race who, you know, you know, they could unload half their team and they'll still somehow will find a way to win 90 games. So uh, that that's, that's going to be the, the two teams for me to watch for sure. So I initially had um, same thing as Tony Dodgers, Blue Jays, or I guess you too, Andy, yeah. we're just right now, because here's the thing we're like, Oh yeah, for sure. The Dodgers and the Blue Jays. And it's like last year, it's like, but then you have someone like the Braves come in, you know? So yeah. it seems so obvious from the start and I'll even throw in there. I thought in the L initially, like my gut was like white Sox, but I think when you take a closer look just with the injury situation right now to the rotation, like with Lynn, um, I mean, we saw the bats that there's no question about that, that game in spring training, they rake, they, they rip yeah. the ball. Um, so I think for them just pitching and like everything coming together, but I, I, whether we're talking like, you know, championship, like winning it all. Um, I think no doubt all of these teams are, are one of those that we're going to be talking about towards the end of the season for sure. Otherwise I think, you know, it'll be a surprise. Something's something's happening along the way. That's preventing that. Cause with those lineups, um, a lot, a lot of good ball players in those. Okay. So we've taken now kind of a, a wider look at everything. I don't know if you guys are just going Cubs here, what you decided, but we have a bold prediction. I'm going just Cubs. So Andy, starting with you, what's your bold prediction for 2022? So for my bold prediction, I'm going to go with the kind of what I mentioned earlier about the Cubs bullpen. I think they're going to have one of the top 10, if not better bullpens in baseball. I think there's just so many arms that I think are going to surprise some people. And I think they're going to be able to get some high leverage outs and be able to keep the, you know, steal some wins in, in, in that res respect where they're going to be able to keep the, the Cubs in games. And, and, you know, a, a one run ball game won't be too, won't, won't be too worrisome when, when some of these guys come out and, you know, I think David Robertson, guys like that are just going to be so huge for the Cubs uh, this season for sure. So I'm going to go with one particular player. So this is a quote from Marcus Stroman just the other day, unprompted, said, he's somebody I'll continue to ask questions to. 
I think he's an unbelievable hitter. His ability to barrel the ball. I just want to know his thought process, what he's thinking in certain counts. That's how you learn. Just being able to throw ideas off each other. That's how you learn and take your game to the next level. So he's talking about Frank Schwindel. And it really just, it, it kind of spoke to me that Stroman was asked about, you know, who he talks to in terms of Cubs hitters and bounces ideas off of. And he immediately went to Schwindel and he just talked to, you know, raved about, about, you know, Frank's ability. And, and this is a guy who really has spent just two months in the big leagues. So I think that's really interesting. And, and I mean, I'm a believer in everything he's done. So my bold prediction is Frank Schwindel earns at least one MVP vote this year. I, I think, you know, I, I'm just curious to see what he puts together over a full season. He has this great way about him. Um, you know, there's just something overall about him and the way he's able to hit and his energy that, that I think ends up paying off big and he gets an MVP vote this year. Totally. I mean, he is, I think as we will ask ourselves, can guys like wisdom and Schwindel repeat what they did last year? I think really for both of them, wisdom had some home runs and Schwindel was hitting, um, that at least so far, uh, it's looking like it's you know, it's so early. I hate even it's trending in the right direction, but you know what I mean, right? We've seen some looks at least of that stuff happening. So my bold prediction with the expanded playoffs, I'm saying the Cubs are going to the playoffs uh, because now 12 teams in, um, I think that we talked about their lineup hitting, I think could pan out. Uh, I think a strong rotation. I, I do think this season, it'll be a lot as we've already seen to start it about injuries. So that's another factor that I think, of course, you just can't account for. And I think with the way the Cubs ended last year, got uh, some bats in the lineup. You have a stronger rotation. I think um, it could be exciting. So on that note, we actually had a great, exciting conversation with Nick Madrigal. Tony and I, before we left Arizona, we sat down with Madrigal. So after this commercial break, you're going to want to hear what he had to say from everything about uh, making sure that he stays healthy this season to what he's choosing for his walk-up song. So stay tuned after this. At Wintrust, we know true fans show their team pride every chance they get. With Cubs checking, you'll score a Cubs debit card so you can show your support every time you pay. Open today at Wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. $100 required to open. Member FDIC. We're here with Nick Madrigal in the shade in sunny Arizona. Cubs second baseman. Uh, Nick, we're nearing the end of camp. Almost there. Just what's the whole thing been like for you so far? Yeah, it's been awesome. Uh, you know, it's been a little bit different schedule for, uh, you know, spring training. It's been a little sped up, but, um, you know, it's been great. You know, I, I feel like the Cubs have done a really good job of kind of monitoring uh, guys' workloads and kind of easing them back onto the field and not ramping them up too fast. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm feeling good. I know everyone's excited to get out of here. So, um, yeah, it's been great so far. What has the impressions overall been of the Cubs? You know, it's like, what, nine months since you have been a part of this team, but just like you said, working with the coaching staff or the training staff and getting to know some of the other guys in the clubhouse. It's been awesome. You know, I've made some comments to, you know, some of my friends, family, just this feels really show the whole organization, like a major league, you know, from the facilities to the coaches to the way, you know, the bosses handle guys. It just, the whole organization seems like it's a very professional attitude in the, I, I've been loving it so far, you know, just from the way practices are set up to the coaches, the one-on-one -on -one drills, um, I, I've really enjoyed being here so far. And part of being here, you were saying, is that you're being closely monitored, getting ready for the regular season. And for you, that's also making sure that you go into this season healthy and stay healthy throughout. So what kind of has that process been like? And how is your communication going to be with the staff throughout the season to make sure that happens? Yeah, so that's one of the things I've been kind of, it, it's all, it's been hard for me to really communicate in years past. You know, if I'm feeling some tightness or something doesn't feel right, you know, I've always been one to just kind of play through it, you know, and starting to learn that's not really always the best thing you know there are times where you play through you know some bruises here and there but when something's you know not right you got to speak up because it's such a long season you know you got to stay on the field as much as you can but you got to be smart about it you know so you know coming over here the trainers have been awesome you know they've been there whenever i needed something um you know i've i've done better you know talking to them and you know telling them how i'm feeling and uh yeah, just, just the other day, for example, you know, I was going through warm-ups, you know, my leg was kind of tightened up a little bit, you know, I was trying to work through it, but um, they immediately pulled me out, you know, got me on the training table and immediately fixed what was wrong, you know, and uh, 
so they've had a really smart approach about you know where I'm at and uh, you know it feels good to you know have someone looking out for you and obviously we're getting very close to the end of camp here so the home opener is coming up at Wrigley Field I know you've been there you haven't played there yet what are you looking forward to most about the Wrigley Field crowd and putting on a Cubs uniform there you know I've uh, thought about it for a while now and you know just stepping onto the field for the first time in front of those fans you know I, I was fortunate enough last year to kind of go for a weekend series to just check out the crowd and because I had never been there before. I, I played there during the COVID season. There's no fans in the stands. So, I mean, it's a whole different atmosphere you now. And uh, I, I'm excited just to, you know, be there, step on the field, just just to get playing, you know. It's something I've been looking forward to for a while now. And, uh, yeah, from what I've heard, it's, you know, one of the happiest places, you know, <laughs> in the world to be in front of the Cubs yeah. fans. And just feels like it's a huge party and everyone's happy out there. So I, I'm excited to experience it for myself. What are you most looking forward to when you step on Wrigley, the anticipation from what you've heard, and then what are you most looking forward to showing fans that you can do out there? You know, I, I think just getting started with the guys. I'm looking forward to just getting going. I know there's a lot of new faces in the clubhouse. Um, I mean, the chemistry seems like it's been great so far. You know, everyone's talking to everyone, you know, from pitchers, position players, um, got a couple older guys, younger guys. It seems like we got the whole mix. So I'm, I'm just excited to get going and see what, what we can do, you know. Um, you know, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be fun. You know, I think uh, you know a lot of people are kind of saying mixed things about our team, but I think you know once we get out there, you got to play the game of baseball. You know, so I think that's what's so beautiful about this game. You know, anyone can be anyone any given day, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. You know, play in front of these fans and show them what we can do. With uh, coming over to this new team, but just being here, you know, in spring training. What stood out to you about some interactions with guys, whether it's you know guys like Hayward or Contreras or Hendricks who have been here for a while, or some of the prospects maybe asking you questions, picking your brain? What what kind of interactions have stood out to you? Yeah, so I've always seen you know some of the older guys, Hayward, Contreras. I'm, I mean, not older, but been in the league for a mm -hmm. while now, and uh, I've seen them from afar, you know, on you know different teams. But um, to actually talk to them, you know, pick their brain a little bit about you know, different situations, pitchers, you know, what they're thinking in the box. Um, you can just see how much, you know, experience and knowledge comes with all that, you know. And, you know, I've been in the league for a couple of years now, but, I mean, I, the, you can always learn something from the older guys, you know. And some of the younger guys in the organization have asked me questions. I mean, I don't have all the answers. I've only been up for a couple of years, you know. But I, I think that's what's so special about the game, you know. You can always pick and choose from different guys and it might take one one thing to click with someone you know so there's been a lot of conversations around the complex whether in we're in the weight room or in the clubhouse just about the game of baseball you know so I, I think that's what's so special about this organization no matter how much time you have or how little time you have you can always talk to someone in the clubhouse or around the facility and how about the conversations just with your teammates getting to know them uh, who have you kind of clung to a little and I know that you in some ways knew Seiya before, right? You yeah. gave him a little pitch, but now as you get to know him, uh, just what that's been like. Yeah, Seiya's been awesome. He, he's fit right in, you know. It, it seems like he's been over here for the last couple years. You know, he's joking with guys. He's, you know, having fun, smiling, and uh, it's been awesome to kind of connect with him. Um, you could see how much talent he has on the field, but off the field, I mean, he's such a great guy, you know. Um, I've enjoyed talking to, you know, Wisdom, Frank Schwindel, all those guys, you know, it's, I mean, it, from top to bottom, I mean, there's, there's not someone in the clubhouse that you can't talk to, you know, so whether I'm walking down the hallway or in the weight room, I'm always just talking to someone, and, you know, getting to know people, you know, it's a lot of new faces for me, but uh, I, I'm doing my best to try to connect with guys. And when prospects have been picking your brain, um, is it a lot about like your contact oriented approach? And we see, we've seen just the last couple of years, more strikeouts than hits, and you know the rest of the league is kind of zigging. You're maybe zagging a little bit in terms of the highest contact rate. Overall, like, how do you kind of talk about that, and, and has that always been your approach, and it's just something you've been able to excel at? Usually, yeah, some of the older guys would come up to me, and you know, they, they're kind of not sure how to word it, but they kind of <laughs> just say, you know, what do you do with two strikes, you know, because yeah. I know it's gotten a lot of attention the last couple of years, you know. I think it's funny, you know, people are starting to notice it, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just try to talk to him about I, about the mental side of it because I everyone has so much talent to swing at this level, you know. So 
usually when I talk to them, I talk about what I'm thinking in the box, what not to think, you know. Um, so usually that's kind of where I go with that conversation. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's not easy to, because I don't have all the answers for these guys. You know, I, I feel like I'm learning from them as well, you know. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's fun talking to those guys and kind of getting to know everyone around here. What are some of the mental cues when you're in the box, whether it's two strikes or whatever else that you go to? Yeah, so I don't want to tell you all my secrets. That's fine. But, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Just uh, right? yeah. You know, uh, I think the biggest thing is when I get to two strikes, I'm not, in my mind, I'm not worried about striking out. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I saw a quote. I don't know if it was by Babe Ruth or someone, but I saw it on a, a plaque. Uh, it was in, you know, my dad's house. It said, don't let the fear of striking out get in your way. And I, I think that quote is so much bigger than people make it. You know, it's just, if you're, even in life, if you're worried about messing up or doing something wrong, you're probably going to do something wrong and mess up, you know. So when I get to shoot strikes, I'm not worried about like, you know, oh no, I can't strike out here, I tense up. Um, so I think that's one of the things that benefits me the most is I know it's going to happen. I'm not worried about it, you know. It's it's not a good feeling if it does happen, but my mind is usually focused on, you know, just being confident and seeing the ball and hitting it, you know, rather than, you know, tensing up and, you know, the fear of striking out. And you mentioned your dad with that quote. We've talked about this a little bit, but I want to ask you again with your hitting style. You did a great demo for us explaining a lot of the, the tips that you do and the drills. Uh, so going off of that and what Tony was asking, you're saying how you have a more old school approach, right? With your batting stance. Tell me how your dad has helped you with that and just how you developed that over the years. Yeah, so uh, it's always been, you know, my twin brother, my dad, you know, all of us at the field every single weekend, every day, you know. Um, I mean, it's always been a pretty simple approach. You know, we would start hitting off the tee, we'd do some soft toss, and then he would throw live to us. And, uh, you know, we would never do any, you know, short bats or drills or weighted balls or anything like that. I know there's a, a lot of different techniques out there when it comes to hitting and, you know, uppercut swings and all this stuff, but um, we've never ever like dove into that, you know. it's I know it's always been conversation kind of around the baseball fields and that, but we've always kind of stuck to the same approach, you know. it's. You know, it, there are times, um, you know, going through high school, going through, I mean, you know, Little League, all those, you know, where I saw bigger guys hitting the home runs and I thought, you know, I wanted to do that as well. So there were short times where I tried to hit the ball in the air, but um, as I got older, I quickly realized, you know, that does nothing for me if I hit it in the air. Rather, if I hit it on the ground, I could beat it out, you know, they could make an air. Um, so yeah, I, as I've gotten older, I've kind of started to form what, what style of play benefits me the most. But um, it, it's it's been interesting to see, you know, different guys at tournaments, high schools with the uppercut swings and different approaches from you know kind of a fun one for you walk up songs when you come to Wrigley and you come up for the first time how much thought goes into it for you what what kind of songs do you want to hear do you want to get pumped up do you want something that calms you down before the at bat and are you kind of listening to your song much or just locked into the at bat yeah so that's something I've been trying to figure out the last couple of weeks it's it's not easy picking a walkout song I can because, you know <laughs> Um, but I usually like something that kind of gets me more hyped up, kind of getting the right, you know, feel of things. I think if you're feeling confident and hyped up in the box, if, you know, you have a pretty good chance to, you know, hit something hard, you know. So yeah. that's always been my my thoughts on walk-up songs. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going with yet. Um, still work in progress, but yeah, I like more upbeat songs. Sounds When's good. the deadline? When do you need to decide by? <laughs> so they they shot uh, out a text a couple of days ago saying, you know, submit your walk-up song. So I, it's any day okay. now. So I'm, Pressure's on. It's crunch time right <laughs> do now. Do you get to choose at spring or do they just? No, okay. so it was random. Okay. Uh, there were some people coming up. To, I think they had like an opera song for me a couple of days ago. So they, they were <laughs> asking like, I didn't me. do that. Yeah, they were asking that. me if there was anything behind that, you know, by my just telling them, you know, it was completely random. And, uh, <laughs> It, it was just kind of funny. Well, that's a fun note to end on. Nick, thank you so much for the time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Nick. Really appreciate Madrigal's time. It was great catching up with him. And actually, we're going to have access like that all season long. Now, you know, we get to go in the clubhouse, talk to the players. You guys are always working on phenomenal stories that you produce throughout the season. So what can we look forward to, Tony, from both of you and Andy? 
You know, what I'm looking forward to um, is this walk-up song feature. I know we just talked to Madrigal about it, but just, I always think that's really fun. And it's something that's so much easier to accomplish this year in a non-Zoom world where you can go up to guys and talk about it. And it's just a better face-to-face conversation than, than in, you know, the remote at- atmosphere that we were in before. So I think that's a lot of fun. That's something we're going to have leading up to opening day. Um, we have a couple other things in the works, just all these new guys and how they want to play at Wrigley Field. And uh Lance Brozdowski has a new prospect rankings coming out as All well right. uh, in the first week of the season. So that'll be really cool. Um, and then Andy, I know, is working on a really cool story with Hayward. Yeah, I talked to, to some of the other guys on in the clubhouse about Jason Hayward's leadership and just what he brings to the, to the clubhouse, something that you know won't ever get measured in a, in a box score or anything like that, but just the role he plays and how you know that's going to be just as crucial to the development of or the development of any players or anything that we talked about, you know, just his leadership and his presence. Um, so keep an eye on that uh, coming up on marqueesportsnetwork.com. Yeah, awesome. And I know, Andy, you're working hard even before spring training yeah. uh, at the camp there with the prospects. So from beginning to end, we have you covered. And what, Tony, you didn't want to ask about walk-up songs and Zooms? I mean, you didn't want to ask about <laughs> no. well, no, it. Yes, yeah, because then everybody else would be able to take that. And That's now true. I can that just focus on that. Yeah. And, you know, and like Ethan Roberts is using a walk-up song with Marcus Stroman and it's like, That's oh, true. then I can ask more questions and I don't have to like zoom in on it. It was just, it was nice to have like multiple follow-ups and get more of this stuff. And it's just like, it's so much better in person than, yeah. than Zoom. We're getting the exclusives content. on the walk-up yeah. song. Yes, so exactly. we got you covered. No one's yeah. stealing that content. All caps, tweet, exclusive, colon, <laughs> Cubs walk-up song. <laughs> Well, we hope you enjoyed this edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast, giving uh, our best ideas on what you could see throughout this season. Each week, we will be talking about this team and see how things pan out. So that'll do it for this edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust. Don't forget to download and subscribe to the pod on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And check us out in video form on the Marquee Sports Network app and YouTube. For Andy Martinez, Tony Andraki, and myself, we'll see you soon.